Hi, I'm Sheena and this is Perilous Prose and today I have a little bit of a review book talk for you about a book that I recently finished up in January. I've been talking about it a lot on this channel because it took me a while to get through it. And that book is The Mummy by Jane C. Mudan. I read this book on my Kindle so I don't have a physical copy to show you and there isn't really cover art for it because it was first published in 1827. I believe it's technically out of print so I don't have anything pretty to show you over here. Um, but this was written, like I said, in 1827. Um, the author was 17 years old when it was published. She started writing it after her father died. She was an orphan and she was just trying to find a way to survive in the world without her parents as so she turned to writing. Um, it was heavily influenced by Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, which came out in 1818. And if she didn't read Jane Austen, then she was at least uh, influenced heavily by a lot of the same uh, authors and literary influences because you can see that a lot in her writing. So if you are a fan of those two authors, then I would recommend that you pick this up because it's going to be right up your alley. Jane Luden did go on to write more after this. She had one other work of fiction that was published. After that, she turned to writing gardening manuals with her husband, but she never returned to fiction after that. But she was writing science fiction before it was technically a genre. Um, the Mummy is generally considered to be the first steampunk novel in which, uh, if you're not familiar with steampunk, it's sometimes called retrofuturism. It's the way that the future was envisioned by people in the 19th century. The story basically follows two families. You have Sir Ambrose who has two sons. The older son is Edward who is a war hero. He's just coming back from India, I think. Um, you know, he's the guy that everybody loves, the golden boy. And then there's his younger son, Edric, who is more blue stocking. He likes science. He's bookish. And uh, Sir Ambrose has a best friend who is the Duke of Cornwall. And he has two daughters. One of them is Elvira, who is very sweet, very kind. And then there's Rosabella, who is a little bit younger. She is very energetic, ambitious. She's definitely the Slytherin in this story. Um, and the two of them hatch a plan that they're going to marry off their kids to each other. So Elvira and Edward will become engaged, and Edric and Rosabella will be engaged. And Edric and Rosabella are both extremely opposed to this plan. And Edric's just like, nope, you know what, I, I can't marry her, she's a total bitch. So I'm going to go off to Egypt. And so he goes away with his tutor and they go to Egypt because Edric thinks that it might be possible for him to use a very high powered battery to resuscitate the dead. Why choose a mummy that's been dead for thousands of years instead of someone more recently dead? Because, of course, there's plenty of dead people in England. One simple reason. Mummies are less disgusting. <laughs> it's pretty clear from the outset that Jane Ludon has only a passing familiarity with uh, Egypt and uh, Egyptian history. So she, she just kind of took what she had heard and ran with it. So Edric gets to Egypt. He and his tutor, Dr. Entwarfen, find uh, the find the mummy of Cheops, or Khufu, um, as he would be known today, and they hook up the battery and they resuscitate him. And it works better than expected. Well, when the local people find out about this, they completely flip out. There is mass panic in the streets and the two of them are arrested for witchcraft and thrown in a dungeon in Egypt, and that's all we hear from them for about six months to a year or so. Meanwhile, the mummy manages to steal their hot air balloon and flies back to England, where he immediately gets embroiled in all of the politics that are going on, because on top of being the daughters of a duke, Elvira and Rosabella are also the heirs to the throne because in this world that uh, Jane Luden has created, it takes place in 2127, so 300 years after it was written. And the politics and the religion have changed a little bit. There's some technological differences, obviously. And in this world, the queen is actually uh, legally not permitted to marry. 
it's very much influenced by Queen Elizabeth I. And so the queen is, is supposed to dedicate herself completely to her country and her heir is chosen from her young relatives between the ages of 20 and 25. They must be female, they must be unmarried. So Elvira and Rosabella are the top two picks to be queen. And when the queen dies suddenly, um, then there's this whole political maneuvering. There's one camp for Elvira and one for Rosabella, and the queen has to be elected from Parliament. Khufu or Cheops gets thrown into this, and he's uh, maneuvering everything from the background. And he ends up taking on almost like a twisted fairy godmother type role. Um, he's very much guiding the other characters. You don't really know which side he's on. As he gets closer to the end of the book, he's sort of bringing things together and, you know, teaching characters lessons about their own vanity and their hubris. So that's the basic premise of the story. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, it is completely ridiculous. It is hilarious in just how unlikely some of this stuff is, at least to look at it now. From what I've read, it seemed perfectly plausible in 1827. It's written very wordy, especially when some of the servants speak, you get very, very wordy prose. And I'll actually read you an example of this. So this is a quote from the butler, and he is speaking to Edric. Um, his father has just received a telegram from Edward. He wants to know whether or not he's alive or dead or how the battle went that he's just finished. And in 1827, they didn't have the electric telegraph. They had telegraph towers, which were these big, tall wooden buildings, and they would have flash lights, and that was how the telegraph worked. So Sir Ambrose is outside on the balcony, and he's trying to read this telegraph message. And uh, Abelard goes in and finds Adrak and says, That worthy gentleman, your respectable progenitor, requests you instantly to put in exercise your locomotive powers to join him on the terrace to the end, that there your superior visual faculties may afford a soulage mal to the mental anxiety under which he at present labors by aiding him to develop the intelligence conveyed to him by the telegraphic machine. In translation, your dad's on the terrace and can't read the telegraph. Will you please come tell tell him what it says. So that's an example of some of the language that you have in here. It's not all like that. You see it mostly at the beginning and then there's one section in, I think it's volume three that gets really bad. But for the most part after, um, but when you get about halfway through volume one, it starts to kind of tone down and become a little bit more readable. Um, some of the other just kind of ridiculous things that you see in this book, when um, Edric and Dr. Edwarfin are captured by the Egyptians and thrown into the dungeon. Everything's perfectly okay. They have a perfectly comfortable living space because inside his walking stick, Dr. Edwarfin has like beds and cots and he's got food and pen and ink and you know everything that they need to make themselves comfortable. And I find it really hilarious that she has found ways to update certain aspects of technology, but the main form of ground conveyance is still horses. People are still writing with pen and ink. But uh, for other things that work perfectly fine and for the most part generally work in the same way, she's going to completely change them. Like the postal system in this world, instead of, you know, sending messengers by horseback or by carriage, they have cannons in every city and village and they put the letters into a cannonball and fire it at the neighboring village where it's caught in a giant net and then the post is sorted and fired on to the next location and it, it's just stuff like that that just you can't help but laugh at it because it's so ridiculous you can also tell that one of the biggest technological advances around the time it was being written was the discovery of asbestos and this was very important and it was, you know, the big miracle thing that had come out because all of their paper is made out of asbestos and all of their clothing is made out of asbestos because it was the fancy new thing in 1827. When you find out later on that women wear hair ornaments made of controlled fire, you know, maybe that asbestos clothing makes a little bit more sense. It's absolutely 
ridiculous and hilarious. It's not highbrow literature by any sense of the imagination, but it's definitely the good other for a thing laugh. That I wanted to mention with this is just the general availability of the book. Like I said, it's out of print. I did find a copy on Amazon. It is $2.99 for the Kindle download there. I also did some Googling and found a few places where you can download it for free because this isn't something that you're going to find in your typical public library or bookstore. It's not available on Overdrive or any place like that. Um, you can read it on Google Books. And then um, I did find what appears to be an audio edition on archive.org. There's also um, another download that you can get from Adelaide University for the Kindle, which I believe is free. So there's a couple places online that you can find it, but if you're looking for like a hardcover or a paperback version, I only found one source for that. It was on Amazon and it was like $25 to $35, somewhere in that neighborhood. And for me, I don't think that it was worth that price just because this is something that I was kind of reading to laugh at. Um, it, it's not something that I see myself rereading. I gave it three stars on Goodreads. It is enjoyable, but it's, like I said, it's not highbrow literature. It's probably not something you're going to come back to unless you just really enjoy the humorous side of it. It's not a book that really takes itself seriously. So that was The Mummy by Jean Luden, and I hope you enjoyed this. If you have read it or heard of it, um, or if you have any questions, you can leave me a comment down below. I will leave a link to the Goodreads page, which doesn't have a whole lot of information on it. Um, and also I'll have links to my social media page, and I will see you guys next Saturday. Thanks!